Welcome to another edition of the Five Star Zone. Rico Beard, Howard Griffith. You see him on the Big Ten Network. Howard, you know what? <laughs> I was going to start this a different way, but you kind of came in and uh, you dropped the bomb. What's going on, man? What's happening at Nebraska? We're going to find out soon. It seems that, you know, my, my phone's been blowing up saying that, um, you know, there's some meetings going on amongst their uh, – they're bored there, so maybe they're getting ready to make a decision as far as a coaching uh, search is concerned, or maybe they're not. But it's always curious when uh, when when boards come together for a special meeting. I mean, what do you think Nebraska is going because because Scott Frost and and you know, hold on, we 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 made this for you, Scott, a long time. <laughs> My radio partner told me at the beginning of the year that this was Scott Frost's year, and I was like, yeah. man, they could lose that first game. So, Howard, it's been such a long time. Where, where do you think that they're going? Because I really haven't heard any rumors to where Nebraska was looking. I mean, I always heard the Urban Meyer thing, but I'm thinking, yeah. would Urban really go to Nebraska? <laughs> yeah, and I think, you know, I was one of the ones that thought, you know, not that it was going to happen, but thought that Urban would be – a, a heck of a pick for them because I think uh, when you think about where Nebraska is and you think about their fan base, they really want to win right now. And, um, you know, I thought Urban is the kind of guy that can make that happen. Uh, but I think the other side of it, when you start to look at it, they need somebody who's built the program, uh, that can build a program, sustain a program. And, you know, their names out there have been floated for, for a long time. That rule was one of the names that came up even when he was still – uh, employed by the Carolina Panthers that if something happened there, because there were a lot of rumors about that, that maybe he would be the perfect pick for uh, a team like Nebraska. But, you know, Mickey is a, a – Joseph is a, is a super recruiter and doing the things he's supposed to do. Right. But I think when you, you start to look at Nebraska, they've got to make a decision on what direction they want to do. And, and the one thing I do know is that Trev is going to make the right decision. He's a strong – he's a strong athletic director, understands what he wants from – the football program and understands how that program should run. So it's no doubt that he's going to get the the, the right person uh, to get the program turned around. Now, whether it's going to be a quick fix or whether it's going to you know take a couple of years, you know that remains to be determined by whoever uh, decides it's going to occupy that corner office. See, here's the thing about Nebraska. Nebraska, Howard, falls into one of those programs that I think the problem is they can't get out their own way. They want to go back to the days of glory. They're not willing to pay the prices. I want They want to take the shortcut and just go jump straight to the good part. Yeah. And instead of doing the building, I, when I look like, a pro, like Texas, like certain schools, you know they want to be good, but it's like, guys, you, you got to grow this thing the right way or else you're going to keep firing coaches and firing coaches. I look at Nebraska, like I said, Miami, yeah. Florida, like those schools – can they can they just let a guy come in there and really grow that thing up? And I don't want to hear about tradition and what Tom Osborne would have done. Can you just let a person be a person? Because I think about when Rich Rod came to Michigan, and I always laugh because I said this. If Michigan would have allowed Rich Rod to be Rich Rod and bring his defensive coordinator, Michigan would have been a powerhouse, not Ohio State. He had to spread at Michigan before Ohio State had to spread. And now, you know, Ohio State kind of said, well, we'll forget about all of that stuff and we'll just let Urban be Urban and mm -hmm. you see what happened. Yeah, I mean, you, you think about it, you know, Rich Rod was, you know, on the forefront, as you mentioned, when you started to talk about the spread. And, and to me, you know, it only shows, it, you only get an opportunity, you see a guy like Denard Robinson. And, and listen, I, I know Michigan fans were a little upset that, you know, he couldn't throw it around, but I don't know that they've had a more dynamic quarterback since then, right? I mean, he was a special, special player at the quarterback what? position. Here's and the first he's thing. a game changer. Howard, the one that I thought, if, if Rich Ross stays, the one who I thought really could have catapulted Michigan into that, that next category was Devin Gardner. Yeah. Because Devin could throw. Yep. And Devin could run. Now, he wasn't like Denard Robinson when he was mm -hmm. trying to run 80 yards. But De and he was bigger and stronger. He yeah. could take that hit. And I'm like, you know. Because I was like, man, if you keep Devin, put Denard in the backfield, now yeah. you got that old uh, Pat White, Steve Slayton type of thing going on yeah. like they had at West Virginia. I, that's what I always thought. But 
Michigan wasn't patient. And, and I guess I, to bring it back, when I look at teams like Nebraska, it's like, are you going for the quick fix home run hire? Or are you trying to bring in somebody who could really put some roots now and clean this thing out and fix it? Because you, Nebraska really hasn't been good in a long time. Well, well think about this. You know, they went to, uh, at the time, the, the Big Ten championship game. And, you know, they got demolished in that game. But, you know, they still have been there. And one of the things that happens, man, I, you know, it's one of those things like Nebraska was winning nine games, but then people were complaining that it was not the right nine games. And they were concerned about what the coach looked like on the sideline and whether he was upset or not. And it's, you know, you have all those things and now they fall into where they are now. The challenge is going to be, and you already said, it, they have to hire a person who can be able who, who's probably been some other places and had some success, maybe been to the NFL and not quite had the success that they would want, but can see a program and understand that they're going to have all the resources. Because that's that's one thing Nebraska is not going to lack for is resources that are going to be poured in uh, to football and athletics. They've got all of that. You know, they're building and adding on to facilities as we speak right now. So having that guy that can stick there and be there for a while is what it really is ultimately going to take. That's going to have the vision to where football is headed. And, and when I talk about that, we only look at we only have to look at a couple of programs. You look at Iowa, you look at Wisconsin, you look at uh, Northwestern. I'm not saying that you know you can't win the way they're winning it, but I would say that they're probably doing it the way traditionally uh, those programs have been run. And that's not where the elite of college athletics is running right now. You know, it's 50 plus um, support staff members that they have on their roster uh, as far as outside of just your coaches and GAs, whether, you know, they're doing recruiting, whether they're doing, uh, whether they're looking at, uh, you know, a transfer portal, NIL, all of these different things have now come to the forefront and you look at the most successful programs that are out there are the ones that are, that are doing well right now. Their back office is huge, and yeah. that's where college athletics is gone, and that's where it's going. And if you're not going to be committed to doing that, you're going to be slow for change, and you're going to find yourself, you know, behind. And right now, you see some of our traditional powers are behind. And you look at Illinois right now; they believe in the back office, they believe in all that support and help, and, and you see what they're doing. And part of that is obviously the coach, but th you've got to make those slight adjustments. Yeah. No, no. But when you look at teams like that, it, it is something that some schools just get it. But I think when you're that powerhouse school, man, people always want to go back to the good old days. Yeah. We we used to do this and we used to say I always thought Nebraska's biggest problem when they joined the Big Ten was they, they left their base of Texas because they got a lot of people out of Texas when they were in the Big 12. And it was almost as if they tried to go get the Midwest kids. And it's like, no, you got to remember your base. Yeah. So you, you got to hope that maybe that coach can, because you're right. I remember when they went out there, when they were good, had Indomitian Sue, and, you know, before they came to the Big Ten, and they did mm -hmm. make it there once. I think that, that was the team that – was that the team that lost to Ohio State, the, the eventual uh, national title? Yeah, they lost to – who did they lose to? Yeah, they got they got pounded by whoever it was. I mean, it was, it was kind of – it was crazy. Yeah, it, yeah, it was embarrassing. Um, but I just when I, when I see that it's just it's interesting to see the name because you're right you got tons of resources you're the only game in town in that state so you don't have to compete with a professional team it's you you know and and this is nice stadium you know they the fans are there regardless of win or lose that that tells me a lot that even through these lean years man they still got that fan support. Rico, I'm going to tell you something that I, that I had never seen before. And this is when my son was coming out of, out of high school. Um, he went to a camp there. And I kid you not, there had to be somewhere between twelve and 15,000 fans at a high school football camp put on in Nebraska. Yeah. <laughs> so that kind of gives you a little insight to how important football is to the state of Nebraska and how engaged their fan base is when they're coming to watch, you know, 16, 17, eight year old kids wow. run around up and down the field, hoping 
that, you know, maybe they will at some point don the, the Nebraska uniform. So the support is there. Uh, they've had success. They just, they have to understand that you have, they, the success that they want to have moving forward will have nothing to do with the past because football is not played the way, you know, they were so accustomed to it under, under Osborne and, you know, Bo Pelini, I'm going to tell you, Bo Pelini was an unbelievable coach and, and still is. But right. as I mentioned earlier, every time something would go wrong, television directors did what? Pan, pan right to Bo Pelini because they knew they would give him a look. Yeah. And, you know, people talk about, well, you know, he shouldn't be like that with the kids, shouldn't do this. And those players loved him, you know, because he was real. I mean, yes, he got mad at him, but he also loved him up. But that, that's not the part that they showed. So No, no, you're right. Because I remember they used to do the same thing with, with Brian Kelly at Notre Dame. Mm -hmm. They would catch him all red face screaming at somebody. It's like, okay, you're cheating right now. That's not fair. You don't show him when he patting the player on the back. Oh, somebody made a mistake. Mm -hmm. Quick, get to Brian Kelly. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it, it's so. So when do you think we could possibly see some movement today? Man, I wouldn't be surprised if they're if they're meeting today. They probably are coming down to making a decision of the direction they want to go. Um, so we'll we'll have to stay tuned to that one. Um, but it looks like something could be imminent. Come on, Howard. Howard, you know he got that secret file, folks. Yeah. <laughs> I wish I did. I mean, I would. I'd love to break the news, but I have no idea. I don't get a chance to sit in those meetings. But listen, I, I think if the right coach is out there, um, like I said, Trev, I, I believe that he's a, a strong AD. And he, he's going to continue to do great things at Nebraska for that program. Uh, he knows what he wants. And if the, if the coach is available right now, if there's a coach out there that's available, including the one on his own roster uh, right now that's leading the program in Mickey, um, he's going to go get him and he's going to commit to him. Because I think the other side of it, too, is, you know, we're winding down to the football season, particularly if you're, you're a team that, that's not competing for a Big Ten championship and you're a team that, that may not make a bowl or on the fringes of, of trying to make a ball, you've got to make a decision there because recruiting is important. And you got to make sure that you're not setting your program back by waiting too long to make a decision at the head coaching spot that these recruits that are out there are sitting there waiting like, well, I don't know what they're going to do. Because right now, everybody, most of the play, players are committing in December at the early signing period, right? They're not waiting. They're not waiting until what the traditional – uh, signing period has been in the past. Now, do you so think they gotta make a decision? If, if they went with the interim coach, I hate to say it, but would that be a big enough splash to satisfy the fan base? Or are you out there only waiting for a big name to say, yeah, look at what we got? Because a lot of times, man, the interim coach could be the best thing for you. Yeah. You just don't have that cachet. Yeah, and, that, and that's why I say it's so important to have an athletic director who can sell his, his person and his coach because the I would say that athletic director that doesn't have the the swag or or the credibility uh when hiring a coach you know he may have to try he or she may need to to rein in support and try to sell uh the next coach but I don't think Trevor is that kind of he's not that type of leader I, I think he can he's strong enough where he can go in and say this is our guy this is why we're going with this person right now, and this is the importance of it, and you know the board will feel comfortable with that. All right, go ahead. You can blink twice if it rhymes with Durbin Sire. <laughs> uh, yeah, I don't think it's going to be that, but you know, you never know. All right, I, I, I wanted to go into a different direction now, Howard. Um, my alma mater is playing your alma mater this yeah. week. It doesn't have that same feel just because of all the events that happened in yeah. from last game. My biggest question is this: Being that you've played on in uh, in the league and 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 on, in college, I don't know if you've ever gone through a situation like that. But just kind of from the psyche of the MSU players, the ones who didn't do anything but go out there and play and shake hands, because I think most people forgot that pretty much eighty kids did what they were supposed to do. Ten kind of ruined it for everybody. Yeah. How do you bounce back? How do you rally? Or is this just one of those things that they're already struggling where you just kind of pack it up and hit the reset button and say, I'll see you guys in spring ball? 
Well, I think it's one of those times right now where, you know, the Peyton Thorns of the world, right? Jay Reed's of the world, Henderson's of the world, uh, have to stay, step up and take control of their locker room now, right? And I, that's not to say that they didn't have control of it to begin with. But now's a time where, you know, they're going to need to be able to lean on that leadership. And they need to say, hey, guys, this is not over. Yeah, we've lost some significant parts to, you know, our team that have been suspended. But somebody's got to step up. It's no different than, you know, a player going down with an injury, the way they need to look at it. Other players are going to now have that opportunity to step up and make plays, so they got to take advantage of that opportunity. And you know, it could be a rallying cry. I mean, you know, they can you know get fired up about it because what's you know the the bad thing about it to me is if there are a couple things, right? The young people make mistakes in college, right? You make mistakes, and now for for those players that have been suspended, depending upon the degree of what happened, whether or not you were swinging a helmet, whether or not you were just pushing, shoving, or whatever, it, your college career has now been altered. And that's not to minimize the things that they, I'm not trying to minimize that. But now they have to really refocus and figure out what direction am I going in right now? Because this is this could change and this is going to stick with me for a while. So, you know, I hate to see when young people now get put into a situation where, you know, mistakes of their past uh, are going to haunt them for for their future and hopefully that's not it outside of any of the situations that obviously you know surround a helmet being swung but hopefully they get an opportunity to for redemption to be able to you know come back and whether it's at michigan state whether it's somewhere else to get an opportunity to you know finish their education and, and learn from what they did but the players that are gone, the players that are still there, have an opportunity and a, and a responsibility to the program to go out and continue to try to uh, you know, play as hard, well, play as hard as they can, and, and try to you know clean up what is perceived to be a program right now. I think people will look at it and be like, come on, what, what's going on? Why are those players acting the way they are acting? And unfortunately, right. it, so it, is it just, it, is it just it right the program. Is it just winning? Is that the only thing that can keep people from saying, oh, you guys are a bunch of rogue people yeah. out there just, you know, doing whatever you got to do? Like, I, you know, because it almost feels like they're getting cast as the Miami of the 80s where, you know, they, the you from back yeah. then. And it's like, OK, but you do realize the majority of the kids actually went out and did what they were supposed to do. Yeah. But we see it all the time, right? right. A, a few bad apples ruin, ruin it all for everyone. And part of, listen, I thought Coach Tucker did absolutely the right thing. He moved swiftly with, when he had the, the, the evidence was there, he moved swiftly to suspend the players. And that's, there's nothing more that he could have done. There's nothing more that Michigan State as a university can do at this point outside of, you know, what's going to happen through the legal system. Now, they have to shift and, and understand it's not about what happened in the tunnel last week. It's now about this Illinois football team that they got a chance to go out and play well. And now Illinois, on the other hand, right? Illinois is ranked for the first time uh, in college football, the way it's been structured uh, right now when you talk about going to the playoffs, you know, they've never been ranked in that. So they've got a lot to play for. And trust me, they're not feeling sorry for what's going on in Michigan State. They're gonna go out and what they have to do is go out and you know play the way they've been playing in previous weeks. And it's going to be up to Michigan State to be able to match that type of enthusiasm. But I'll tell you this, I think Coach Tucker, well, I know Coach Tucker have those guys ready because, you know, he's battling two things, right? He's battling this perception of what now people believe his program is right now, which is nothing further from the truth. That's not reality. What, his pro, what, what people saw last week is not what his program is about. So he's battling that as well. So it's going to take a, a concerted effort between the players and the coaching staff to, um, you know, kind of get things back on track. And I guess now, you know, you, you're having several players that, that are decommitting for whatever reason, but you got to try to, you know, figure it out and salvage and, and people get people to understand that what they saw last week is not what our program is about. Now, and, and when I guess you look at it from the flip side of Illinois. I guess, how do you go in there not being overconfident saying, well, we already thought we could beat them, and, mm -hmm. and now they're missing their best defensive player in Jacoby Winman. Yep. Fellas, you know, are you already looking forward to that, that game against Michigan? Yeah. 
they better not. And, and I, I'll tell you this. I think this has been, you know, one of the reasons uh, Actually, Red Bull has done a good job. If you let their guard down a little bit. That's yeah. just the first. Yeah, I, I think this is where, you know, Brett's been in his best, right? He's been able to uh, folk, keep the guys focused on the task at hand. Uh, you know, I talked about you know, watching him coach and seeing him interact with the players. Everything is about situational football. Everything is. I mean, I think he does a great job. He's one of the coaches that does a great job of putting his players through those situations and uh, being able to make quick adjustments, uh, whether it's at halftime or whether his offense defense comes off to the sideline. Um, he's been able to, to press the right buttons. And, and this is going to be another one of those weeks where he's going to have to press the right buttons because – Last week, they were coming off a situation where everybody, their bye week, everybody's telling them how great they are. Now this week, they're facing a Michigan State team who's missing, you know, arguably their best player on the roster right now. Um, and there's Michigan is looming. So now they're going to be people that say, guys, if we just win this week, you win next week, you beat Michigan. Wow, we've got a chance at the playoffs. Now that's one step at a time. You better take care of this Michigan State team. Because if you don't, I mean, they still have their weapons. They still have offensive weapons. And you know, they're going to make some things happen offensively and just stress this Illinois defense. So there's a lot to, that Illinois needs to be on guard for uh, when they play Michigan State, even though they're going to be down several players. Well, you know, we got to have some fun with this, Howard. So, you know, before we wrap this up, th think okay. about what you want to put on the line for this oh. game. Oh, 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 I was going to say oh. my boy is going to rally up they're going to get the W in Champaign and come back with a win and be two wins away from a bowl game. So you think about what you want to put on the line. Well, I'm just saying, I mean, you know, Chicago, you know, we've got unbelievable pizza and beer. So I'm just saying. You know what? Okay, <laughs> Illinois win, you got a gift certificate to your favorite pizza joint. Okay, and, and Michigan State wins, you got a gift certificate to your favorite space. Okay, that, I see that. That's what I'm talking about. Now, I feel good, and, and this is non football related, but it's one of the dumbest things ever because <laughs> I was hoping it would have happened last week, but it didn't. They postponed it. Mm -hmm. But a little known fact whenever the artist Drake puts up some type of thing on the internet, uh -huh. he drops an album or a song. The very next day, MSU has been 10 and 0 in their Ooh. football game. So, I know. Silly fact. You can throw that on your BTN network. Well, wait a minute. You're telling me Drake is getting ready to drop? He's dropping uh, tomorrow. Tomorrow. Yeah. Okay. Oh, I love it. I love it. So whenever he drops, okay. MSU is 10-0 and 0 the very next day. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I love that one. That's a great one there. So just just, just something to think about. Um, real quick, for, uh, one last thing. College football playoff. Yeah. Uh, when the poll comes out, it came out, and, and yeah. I, it was just funny because I I had put Michigan at five, and a lot of my listeners here in Detroit just was like, "Well, you just saying that?" It's like, guys, I've seen what they do, and yeah. I think the schedule came into to play a part of of what happens. Are you a four team guy or are you a twelve team guy? Because I've I've learned in life, either you think that four is the best, or you think that man, this thing should have been expanded a long time ago. Yeah. You know, for, I come at it from two angles, right? I, I come at it from, you know, the 12 teams, there are more, more programs involved, obviously, with 12, but then you have other programs that have an opportunity to get into that, that top 12. And I look at it from the fan base standpoint as well. I'm a big proponent of uh, having games on campuses. I like that aspect and what it would do for college athletics. I think when you have four, the issue becomes, it becomes so regionalized. And, and you know, there's, that's what it is. I mean, you're going to have the Alabamas, you're going to have the Clemson, Georgias, uh, you know, Ohio State, now the Michigans that are going to be involved. But we really haven't necessarily seen that powerhouse that was out West because they haven't played well. I'm talking about USC um, and Oregon, and Oregon's been in that mix. But it, it's been so hard to really been able to, to keep so many keep so many people involved. But the reality is to me, it really is only maybe 14, four to five, maybe six teams that have a legitimate shot of winning the national title each and every year. That's just the reality of it I, I, to me. But I do think having more teams involved is better uh, for the sport overall because you have more fan bases or they get an opportunity to be engaged. Now for me, I have Michigan number one. And I know how bad the, the, the preseason schedule wasn't great, but I had Michigan number one. I had Ohio State number two. 
And Tennessee is they can score a gang of points, but they can't stop anybody. No. They can't stop anybody. You know, they had 17 penalties when they beat Alabama. Well, they didn't, but Alabama had 17 penalties. Alabama's not what they used to be. We'll find out a lot about this Tennessee team. And to me, that's what it comes down to, right? You you have the first rankings, that comes out, but it's so much more football to be played. We're going to find out about Tennessee. It is. I see, the, this was the perfect year. I wish they had the 12 teams because I think then it would all be about the matchups and the style making the fight because yeah. this team versus this team in this location, mm -hmm. man, you could come up with about five different teams that you could see winning the national title. Right. Because, yeah, Tennessee can't play a lick of defense, but like every team has flaws. Yes. Georgia is the only one that I don't know. I'm mm -hmm. like, is Georgia just bored because, well, we'll turn it on. Like Alabama used to be that way every year. Mm -hmm. See me in late November and then we'll start playing hard. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You treat the whole entire season like your preseason. You know, Alabama, man, I, I have never seen a, a, a defense and a secondary so bad at Alabama. They, mm -hmm. it's, it, it's shocking. I mean, you know, how good is TCU? They're undefeated, but nobody's mm -hmm. giving them any respect. You look at Clemson, I, and honestly, I think one of the teams that they lost early and people forgot about them, but if it was a 12-team playoff, I'm looking at, like, LSU. Yeah. LSU, they beat Alabama. They won't get a shot at playing in the four. Mm -hmm. They may be one of the best teams in college football. So I like the fact that by expanding it, you're right. Fans and teams aren't out of it. If you lose a couple of games early, you mm -hmm. still have a chance to rally, regroup, and come in being one of the hot teams, you know, and 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 I think that's what was needed. And yeah. I've often said, man, it's real simple. If they would just, I'm just waiting for them to call me because I can solve this for them so quickly. <laughs> it's easy, man. Two weeks after the college championship games, you play your quarterfinal games at mm -hmm. the home stadium. So yeah. whoever it is, you get to play at home. One through four, get the bye week. It, yeah. it gives you incentive. Okay, if you're five through eight, it's a guaranteed sellout. So you're going to make money. Yeah. And then you go into your regular bowl games that set it up for, you know, the, the other ones. But I'm like, just play it like December 15th or 16th. What a better way to lead into the lesser bowl games. Mm -hmm. Okay, you're going to play the Bahamas Bowl. And then after that, you'll go down to, you know, Alabama as Alabama takes on Oregon type of thing. Yeah, yeah. It works. It makes too much sense yeah. in what it is. It, it, it does. It, it works. And, and you know, I, I truly believe that, that we're gonna we're gonna get to that. Um, where we're gonna see, you know, the 12 teams and obviously on campus and see some of those things. Uh, because it's neat. I mean, the the college football being regionalized was, you know, I, I, it was an unintended consequence uh, of what happened. And, and I think as we move through, whether it was the BCS, uh, you know, all of these different ideas of how we we're going to come up with uh, that national championship game, there's always been some flaws to it. And, you know, it takes time. To me, the crime is not adjusting. It's one thing to come up with a plan and you really don't see the unintended consequences, but not to adjust, not to shift and to make the product better is where the crime lies. But you know, I, I think, you know, cooler heads will prevail. And again, it comes back to this. There's so much money involved that people are counting exactly where, where each one of those uh, pennies is going. And they want to make sure that they're able to maximize those dollars. And to be able to maximize those dollars says you need 12 teams, uh, at least 12 teams, a 12-team playoff. And that doesn't appear to be that far off in most likely 2024. Yeah, I, I wish they would just go ahead and make it 2023, but you know, we'll we'll see what happens. Howard, we'll see. Howard, uh, I will say good luck, but I want that gift card. So <laughs> this is gonna be a good one, man. It's gonna be fun. You know, it's listen, I, I, I know this game has lost some of its luster a little bit, but I think it's still a fun opportunity, fun game. I think Michigan State has a heck of a lot to play for. Coach Tucker, his coaching staff, a heck of a lot to play for, and obviously on the Illinois side an opportunity to continue to uh, go on their quest uh, to represent the West in the Big Ten Championship game. Yeah, I think we're going to be the, probably the only two people watching that game while the rest of the country is watching Georgia and Tennessee play. Yeah. At the same time. Thank God for, for multiple screens in the household. No doubt.
Appreciate it. Let's meet back up later on next week. We can recap what happened over the past weekend for Howard Griffith. I'm Rico Beard. Thanks for watching and listening to the Five Star Zone. Make sure you keep subscribing. Tell your friends. Let's keep growing this thing out, folks. We'll see you guys next week.